Good morning and welcome to the Sardis Baptist Church Virtual Meeting House. We are delighted to have you here on this, the third Sunday of Easter. If this is your first time being with us, we want to say twice welcome. Thank you for finding us in virtual spaces. We also want to remind newcomers that there's more information about our church available on our website at sardisbaptistcharlotte.org, sardisbaptistcharlotte.org, as well as all of our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We have one brief announcement before we begin. This morning's uh, worship service is composed slightly differently. Uh, this morning's prayer of petition will follow the sermon. For those of you joining via Zoom, uh, you may use the chat window or uh, ask to be called on and we can take those prayer requests in real time. If you're on Facebook Live, you can also comment and we'll try to pick those up as well. If for some reason we miss any of your requests, feel free uh, to add those to the comments on Facebook Live or to email the church office and we will be sure to include your prayer requests uh, in this upcoming week's uh, church email. Again, we want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule uh, to be with us on this Sunday morning. With that, Sardis Baptist Church, let us worship God together. We invite you to consider the symbols of our faith. The empty cross, reminding us of God's constant love for humanity. The Word of God, whose stories recount God's steadfast love for God's people throughout the generations. And the light of God, reminding us that the light was in the world and the darkness did not overcome it. And the creation window, a reminder of God's Ruach, that is God's parenting breath that breathes life and love into creation. Sardis Baptist Church, these are the symbols of our faith. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. John 14, verse 27. Drawn by God's presence, we gather. Inspired by God's spirit, we worship. Empowered by God's grace, we live. Opened by God's love, we share. Join your prayer with mine. Our minds are open to you, O Lord. We are alert to the stirrings of your spirit. You know our yearnings and our hopes. You know our fears and the doubts that trouble our souls. Open our hearts that we may draw on your wisdom. As we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Dear one, Closer to us than our own hearts, farther from us than the most distant star, you are beyond naming. May your powerful presence become obvious, not only in the undeniable glory of the sky, but also in the seemingly base and common processes of the earth. Give us what we need day by day to keep body and soul together. Because clever as you have made us, we still owe our existence to you. We recognize that to be reconciled with you, we must live peaceably and justly with other human beings, putting hate and bitterness behind us. We are torn between our faith in your goodness and our awareness of the evil in your creation. So deliver us from the temptation to despair. 
Yours alone is the universe and all its majesty and beauty. So it is. Amen. Hallelujah, sing to Jesus, risen now to reign above. Hallelujah, praise the Savior with the multitudes above. There the songs of saints and martyrs thunder like a mighty flood. Jesus, out of every nation, has redeemed us with his love. Alleluia, not as orphans, we are left in sorrow now. Alleluia, Christ is near us, faith believes nor questions how. This morning's lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. Luke 24, verses 36 through 48. Hear now these good words. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to the disciples, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see me, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when Jesus had said this, Jesus showed them his hands and feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, Jesus said to them, Have you anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 45 continues, Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is, deep, is to be proclaimed 
in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things, Jesus said. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's homily is entitled Resurrecting Audacity. Resurrecting Audacity. Luke's gospel establishes a pattern whereby characters who come face to face with the divine are initially terrified. They are fearful and overwhelmed and afraid and almost paralyzed in the moment. But these characters also find assurance in Jesus' shared humanity and in Jesus' shared vulnerabilities. And this sense of connection empowers lasting and faithful witness. On Christmas Eve, Luke's gospel reminds us that the shepherds were terrified. And I love how the old hymn recounts the story. While shepherds kept their watching o'er silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. The shepherds feared and trembled when, lo, above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. The shepherds' knee-knocking begins at the appearance of the angel of the Lord and intensifies with the angel's outrageous declaration. But their terror soon turns to joy and elation in seeing a newborn Jesus, swaddled in strips of cloth, laying in a makeshift crib in the middle of a makeshift nursery, held in the arms of a frightened but determined young mother. In this very moment, the shepherds know that God has come to share in the human experience and filled with joy, these shepherds become witnesses. They tell this good news of great joy to all who will listen. And while the word terrified isn't repeated a lot throughout Luke's gospel, It is certainly mimicked. The disciples are astonished when Jesus helps them reel in the big catch in chapter 5. And so many fish enter their boats that they begin to sink. And Peter cries out, get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And James and John and Peter see the absurd when Jesus transfigures on a mountain. And one treacherous day on the lake, the disciples learned that this friend of theirs can tame the waters, even walk on them. In each instance throughout the gospel, fear and amazement and even disbelief give way to peace and accessibility and belief. The disciples are reminded that they are in the presence of God and that in God's presence, extraordinary things can happen. And in each instance, Jesus' human body remains a tangible connection to their own humanity. For the disciples can still grasp his gleaming, tied white garment and they can share a meal around a table and they can occupy the same space that he does. The disciples have seen and they have heard and they have touched and they can tell others if they so choose. In this morning's text, there's more of the same. Gathered together, perhaps in the very same space they shared the Passover meal, the disciples and their extended friends and family recount tales of Emmaus Road and the empty tomb. And gathered together, telling the story of the one whom they follow, they are startled, terrified, to find a ghostly Jesus among them. 
but they can see his fragile body, one just like theirs. And Jesus requires a meal and companionship and shelter just like them. And somehow, some way, the disciples are able to see that the resurrected Jesus still contains the pre-resurrected Jesus. That is to say that somehow, some way, this transformed Jesus still shares in their humanity, still shares in their vulnerability, still occupies the same space as each one of them. The Gospel of Luke for me, and even the whole of Israel's faith story for me, is about the wonderful audacity of God. We worship one who marshals the creative powers of a vast and complex universe and yet chooses to be revealed to and be expressed in something as simple and tiny as you and me. We are both overwhelmed by God's magnitude and overjoyed by God's investment in us and alongside us. And to imagine the possibility that our lives, indeed every life, can be used for God's good purposes, can have inherent value, can literally bring about God's world, such a thought is terrifying in every sense of the word. And I think throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus introduces us to the tension of holding this weightiness and accountability alongside this freedom and potential. Who am I but a lowly shepherd? And yet you allow me to both witness and bear witness to Emmanuel. Who am I but a lowly servant girl, and yet you dare believe I am to be the mother of our Lord? Who are we but mangy fishermen and seedy tax collectors and persistent women to get to be your students and to experience this inbreaking kingdom for ourselves? Who are we but scared, scattered, fleeting friends? Overwhelmed by the cruelty of Rome's cross, too scared to even see the end. Who are we to be the ones who get to witness resurrection? They think all of this and yet Jesus says to them and to me and you as well. You are people just like me who can do and be just like me. In a flash, Jesus reveals the arc of the scriptures and reminds this group that his story is not separate from Israel's unfolding story, but is indeed part of it. This is a credentialing and a commissioning. Jesus is telling his friends that they are ready to bring about in Jerusalem the very things he came to do. And I hope, Sardis, it's not lost on you that Jesus' penultimate appearance to the disciples happens in a setting where they are gathered together, sharing a meal and contemplating the very questions he spent his ministry engaging them in. Jesus has made good on the promise of Maundy Thursday. And they, the disciples, and us too, can be assured that the Spirit of Jesus will be present each and every time they and we gather in like manner. Finally, this scene is a wonderful bridge and connector to the next set of Luke's stories, the Acts of the Apostles. In the pages that follow, buoyed by the events of Pentecost, the disciples and their extended family of faith will expand the Jesus movement. Jesus says, you are witnesses to these things. That is, you, the earliest disciples, and us, the current iteration of the Jesus movement, and all that follow are credentialed and empowered storytellers of God's creative acts in the world. It's our turn.
Let me close with a final thought. Resurrection stories are hard to process with our modern sensibilities. Some of us may get bogged down in the pursuit of autopsy details. Others of us may tie ourselves in knots seeking to determine the precise metaphorical intent of the story's author. Still, others of us may just skip on to the next chapter. But I want to invite you this morning to keep focusing on this idea of God's audacity. No matter your belief system, bodily resurrection is a fantastic, incomprehensible idea. Perhaps as incomprehensible or even as audacious as one man's ability to live in such a way as to negate Rome's domination system. Imagine the hopelessness of Roman occupation. Now imagine this one person's radical hospitality and this person's insistent nonconformity to caste system, repeated and consistent in every relationship. And imagine how that commitment negated Rome's ability to rob its most vulnerable and oppressed subjects of their lasting humanity, of their value and dignity as children of God. And even more audacious, imagine that the events of a Sunday morning 2,000 years ago remind us that we too can be agents of such audacity. For me, for me, the concept of resurrection is less about a body and it's more about expressing a belief in both God's ability to do audacious, incomprehensible things and, and God's desire to bring audacious, incomprehensible things into reality. So, when Jesus joins me at the table, still scarred from Friday, but primed for a lasting future, I believe that I too can be a witness to some incomprehensible, audacious things. Sardis Baptist Church, I believe that we can create a world where we don't need assault weapons to settle our disputes, nor to temper our grief or our desperation or our feelings of abandonment. Sardis Baptist Church, I believe that every child in our world can have access to food and to shelter and to education and to health care and to love. And that my children and your children can still have more than enough too. Sardis Baptist Church, I believe that we have the collective resources and compassion and creativity to retrain our police officers to stop seeing marginalized persons as threats that can be targeted and tased and shot and instead to see them as people, people with families and people with backstories and people with value and people with humanity who need to be protected and loved too. I believe that we can create communities that value life more than expired tags and counterfeit $20 bills. In Sardis Baptist Church, I believe that we can be good stewards of our planet and be economically viable at the same time. And I believe that we can create metrics of grace that aren't beholden to the restraints of capitalism. Sardis Baptist Church, I believe that we can be the people God intends for us to be. I believe this. I believe all of this because Jesus tells us that it can be so. And Jesus has shown us that it can be so. And I am terrified because Jesus tells us that we, you and me, are the ones who can help make it so. I think early in this Easter season, we are still in awe that the scars of Friday have not been the final word. 
as our tissue hardens and our resolve strengthens, we hear that we too can help move the world from Friday to Sunday. I think we are called to be witnesses of a wonderful audacity. God's ongoing investment, God's ongoing restoration and recreation of the world. So, Sardis Baptist Church, let's break bread together and share our gifts together and be witnesses to an unfolding audacity together. Friends, may it be so, and may it begin today. Amen.